Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for being here at the Sixth Floor Museum today. My name is Stephen Fagan. I'm the curator, and it's a pleasure to welcome you to a special program that we do called Living History. You guys have just toured the museum and learned a little bit about the assassination and the legacy of President Kennedy, and this is an opportunity uh, for you to interact with someone who actually lived the story of the assassination, someone who was involved in the events of that weekend. And you're in for a real treat today because one of my very favorite people is here. This is is Eamon Kennedy, and he is a photojournalist uh, who was working here in Dallas for a newspaper called the Dallas Times-Herald in 1963, and Eamon was just about everywhere that weekend. He was out at the airport when President and Mrs. Kennedy arrived. He was at the hospital when President Kennedy died. Um, after the assassination was over, he covered the trial of Jack Ruby, the man who shot Lee Harvey Oswald on television. And what's best of all of, of, all of this is that Eamon, several years ago, donated about 1,200 pictures to our museum, the original negatives from his camera. And very recently, we had all of those negatives digitized. We sent them out, had them scanned, so we have all these digital files of Eamon's photographs. And this happened so recently that I just put them into the PowerPoint a few days ago, so you guys today are actually going to get to see some of Eamon's pictures for the first time ever. You're going to be the first group ever to see some of his pictures taken about 55, 56 years ago. So that's pretty exciting. Eamon, thank you so much for being with us today and being our guest speaker. We appreciate it. Thank you for inviting me. Let's start off by uh, taking a look at Eamon back at the time this all happened. So here you are, Eamon. This is... Uh, a picture once you were working at the Dallas Times Herald, right? That's correct. As a staff photographer. Now, Eamon, you are a, a native of Ireland, and your last name is Kennedy. So, does that mean you have a connection to uh, President Kennedy? Well, the, 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 I'd photographed the president before in Canada when he made his first official visit out of the U.S., but uh, my father's name, which I didn't know until he died and I got the birth certificate, his middle name was Fitzgerald, so my father was JFK. Your father was actually John Fitzgerald Kennedy, just not the one we recognize today. But, but there's been, uh, one of your family members did some genealogy research and discovered that you were related to the president's mother, possibly? Well, we, we haven't verified that, but uh, I had an aunt in S S South Africa that spent three or four months in Ireland tracing the family tree, and she maintains that we're fourth cousins to Rose Kennedy. The president's mother. Yeah. Okay. No, well, let's Never take, verified it. Looking at this picture of Eamon, I'm going to switch now to a picture of Kennedy, and, and look how, how much they resemble each other. There's a bit of a resemblance there, I think. I'll go back one more time. The two of you, that hair is good, the, 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 the jaw, it's... it's, it's, it's a pretty good match. So perhaps you are related to the Kennedy family in some way. Now this picture, Eamon, is pretty special because you took this picture of President Kennedy at Dallas Love Field. Tell us about this photo. This was, <clears throat> it's probably the last close-up ever done of, of uh, JFK before he got assassinated. It was right before he got in the limo and I wanted to get a close-up and I positioned myself in front as he was walking towards the walking towards the limo, and I asked, I said, hold it, Mr. President, and he stopped for just about one second, and I was able to get this frame. And then he got in the limo, and off he went. Wow. M maybe, um, maybe when you yelled out, hold it a second, maybe he recognized you as a distant family member, I, perhaps. It's possible, but <laughs> highly unlikely. <laughs> now, you, you mentioned earlier that you had photographed President Kennedy before in Canada. Uh, we, we should point out you were um, born in Ireland, you grew up in London, you worked in Canada. H how did you end up in Dallas, Texas? Um, it was actually a mistake. I, I, was, uh, I, I was on my way across the country from Miami to San Francisco on a bus because I, I didn't want to fly. I wanted to see the country, and I had no idea how far it was, and when we were getting close to Dallas, I asked the driver, what's the next big city? And he said, Dallas. And I said, well, if I check off for a couple of days, is my ticket still good to go on? He said, oh, yeah, no problem. So I ended up getting off the bus, and uh, I went over to the Dallas Morning News, which was 
the competitor of the of the paper I work for, and see to see if I could get a job. And they liked my work, but they, they there was no budget to hire anyone, so they they. they Tom Diller, the chief photographer, drove me over to the Dallas Times Herald, and I went in there and talked with uh, their chief photographer. And I hung out for a couple of days, and and I went out and shot some features, which made front page about three days in a row. And then the the, the chief photographer's wife, Peggy Maziota, um, she actually quit her job so they could hire me, and that that's how I came to Dallas. It was purely coincidental. Wow. Do you, do you still have that bus ticket today? Uh, I don't should, think so. You should have it framed on the wall because it brought you here at the exact moment to uh, capture all of this yep. history uh, that we experienced. So besides this uh, portrait of President Kennedy that we have up here, you took a number of other great photographs um, of President and Mrs. Kennedy at the airport that day. Uh, if you study this photograph carefully, can you guys see a little hint of Eamon in this picture? Who can see a little a little hint of Eamon Kennedy in this photograph that Eamon himself took. What do you see? Right, right. Look at the bottom of the picture there. You can see two hands raised up in the air and the camera. It's the camera taking this photograph. So that's, uh, that's Eamon Kennedy. Now, uh, Eamon, of course, photography was a little bit different back in the 60s than it is today when we all just pull out our iPhones and start snapping mm -hmm picture after picture. So for a photograph like this, raising your camera up in the air, would you just have to hope that you get a good shot? Well, it's just practice. You, you would, the main thing is, if it's cloudy, it's holding the camera steady enough. It's hard to, if you're holding the camera on your forehead, you can, you can um, keep it steady. But if you're holding it above your head, there's, you have to usually use a higher shutter speed because there's a little shake there. And uh, it's just hit and miss if you shoot enough. And your camera wasn't an autofocus camera. No. The, so you had to pre-focus yeah. and assume what the focus was going to be when you held up your mm -hmm. camera in the air. So this was actually a much harder shot to achieve in clear focus than, than it appears. Yes. Okay. And one of the main problems with film back then is the camera only held 36 exposures. And an event like this, you don't really have time to change film in the camera because the event's over. So you have to be judicious how you shoot and not run out of film uh, before the event is over. So how many of you have ever used a film camera, a, a camera with actual film in it? Oh, that's excellent. I am so glad that's to amazing. see that. That's, that's a wonderful thing. So you know that you know, when you have a roll of film in the camera, as Eamon just said, you have 36 shots. And then at that point, you have to take the film out of the camera, well, secure you, you it. You have to rewind it. Rewind it. And, if you uh, take it out before rewinding it, it's Then you've ruined. lost everything. Yeah. yeah. You have to rewind it, put the new film in. That all takes time. Yeah. And meanwhile, the story is happening when you're changing film. Right. Let's look at another picture here. This is actually a picture uh, showing Eamon at uh, Love Field that day. That's Eamon there in the background smiling. And we can see you've got, looks like, two cameras around your neck. Yes. One of them would have been a wide angle. Right. For the bigger photographs. The other one's a medium telephoto. Okay, I see. And the, uh, the, the other reporter wearing the rain slicker there in front uh, is actually uh, became pretty famous later in life. It's a man named Jim Lair who went on to work for PBS and moderated 12 presidential debates. And uh, that man, Jim Lair, actually just died last Thursday. Uh, there's right. been some uh, obituaries uh, on television uh, celebrating the life of Jim Lair. But there he is out at the airport that day with Eamon Kennedy uh, right behind him. Eamon, you're wearing that raincoat because what was the weather like that morning? Raining. It was supposed to be rain. And uh, my main concern was trying to keep the cameras because you can't take pictures and hold an umbrella. It takes both hands. So uh, you tuck the uh, cameras inside the raincoat and sort of pull them out at the last second because if the, if the lens gets wet, you get some sort of blurry pictures. But luckily, when Air Force One came in, uh, it quit raining and the sun came out. It was... It was fantastic. And you were able to get really remarkable shots like this. This is another one where clearly you've got the camera held up high right. over your head. And what a beautiful picture that is. I mean, it's one of the most iconic images of the president and first lady greeting the crowds at uh, Love Field. 
Eamon, were you a Kennedy supporter? Did you like him? Yes, I did. What was it about him that, um, that inspired you or that you, that you liked most? Um, I think he had a lot of personal charm. I, I, I enjoyed uh, watching his speeches. And, mm -hmm. Yeah, so I was, I was a supporter at the time. We look at these pictures. Here's another one uh, that you took at the airport, a little bit closer. This was probably taken at eye level. Close to it, yeah. Okay. When we look at these pictures, of course, it's black and white. Television was black and white. Uh, seeing Kennedy live, in color, as it were, uh, was there anything about him physically that, that struck you that you can share with us today? Yeah, when I, f when I first saw him, he seemed a little shorter than I thought. I thought he was taller, but uh, I guess we're both, both about the same height, but I always thought he was taller than me. But Maybe he seemed larger than life on, on television. I, I think it is, yeah. And um, wasn't Mrs. Kennedy a little taller than you expected? Yeah, somewhat, yeah, she was. I've heard you mention that in the past. So the, the, they came through, they greeted the crowds, got into the famous limousine, and they started off on their parade, which ultimately took them here to, uh, to Dealey Plaza. Eamon, you stayed at the airport. What did you do after this? Um, myself and a reporter, his name was Bob Fenley, we figured it was at least an hour and a half before he came back, so we decided to have some lunch. And we'd gone to the restaurant, which was a Polynesian restaurant at the time, and at the airport. And we sat down, and, and the wait waitress came up and said, the, the, the uh, president's been shot. So uh, we verified it, and then we, we, um, we got out of there and headed for uh, Parkland Hospital, where, the, where they'd taken him. So it was a, a fast drive. Uh, I was one of the first people there, I believe. That's got to be a pretty shocking thing. I mean, you've just seen this man, just photographed him, yeah. and to hear that he's now been shot just a few minutes later. Yeah, but we, we, didn't, we didn't know at the time how serious it was. Mm -hmm. You didn't get your lunch, though, did you? Never got the lunch. So you just got up and went straight to the hospital. Um, yeah. And so we're going to switch from this scene, a scene of, of happiness and joy, greeting the Kennedys, to something much different, much more somber. Uh, this is outside the emergency room at Parkland Hospital. You couldn't get very far, could you? We were cordoned off somewhat, and it, it wasn't something I, was, I, I, I had uh, foreseen because I would have brought longer lenses. Mm -hmm. um, so we were, we were held back from actually getting in real close. Were people from the parade, the, the dignitaries that had been riding in the press buses, were they telling individuals what had happened or what was going on? Well, no one really knew. Um, and then all of a sudden the word came out that the president was dead. Mm -hmm. And then it was pandemonium. And uh, a lot of people crying and uh, really upset. And, and you captured all of that through the lens of your camera. Right. Um, real quick, here's a picture taken by one of your competitors from the uh, Dallas Morning News. Mm -hmm. And um, Eamon Kennedy is in this picture. Can anyone find him? It's a little bit like, where's Waldo? Where, where, where? The white coat. Yeah, there he is right there. Still wearing that, uh, that raincoat. And then next to you with this long lens here, is one of your colleagues from the Dallas Times-Herald, a man named Bob Jackson. Yeah. Um, remember Bob Jackson, because he's going to come up later in this story. And then over here is the chief photographer, John Maziota. He was your boss, the chief photographer. That's right. And it was his wife that quit so that you could have a job on the staff. Exactly. <laughs> so all three of you there waiting at the hospital uh, for word on the president's condition. Yeah. And then, of course, word comes that the president has died. And this is one of your famous photographs, Eamon. Yeah. Is there anything you can tell us about, about these two women? Not really. They were, they were highly distraught, as you can see. And, and, and so was everyone else. So there were, there were actually pictures everywhere. Uh, they just got the news. So. Is, it, is it difficult to, to do this sort of thing, to basically get right in someone's face at a, a very difficult moment? Is it, does it feel intrusive as a photographer? Somewhat. But, you know, it's, it's what you do, and it's, it's a job. And you're, you're there to capture the moment. So you have, to be, you have to be bold and go in and do what you're supposed to be doing. 
So as great as this picture is, it was the next picture you took that really became your signature image, one of your most famous photographs. And it's this image right here of this little girl in tearful prayer. Um, her name, which you didn't know at the time, uh, was Kathy Atkinson. Uh, Eamon, tell us how this picture, this perfect little picture came about with the wind blowing in her hair and everything. Um, it, it's just by chance. I, I noticed the face and the light was good. And I, I cropped it differently. It was shot as a horizontal, but when I printed it for the, to go in the newspaper, I, I cropped it as, as a vertical. And that's the way it was used. Um, it, it, uh, you can see the newspaper. And that, that picture actually was used probably on every newspaper in the world. It's um, on the front page of your newspaper, the Dallas Times Herald here, with the caption, The Grief of a Nation. And it really is representative of, of how people were responding around mm. the world. Her, her face kind of became emblematic Captured. of that. And it was interesting that if she'd been turned the other way, it wouldn't have, the light wouldn't have been any good. And we tend to read from left to right. So having the, the face looking that way, it, 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 it sent, you, you concentrate in on, on the face and the, and the hands. Now, you did not get her name at the uh, hospital. No, no, I didn't. But you found out who she was a few days later? Yeah, it's actually the, uh, she came, to, her and her mother came to the newspaper to, to buy some copies. And, um, and, and the, the uh, women's editor noticed them buying all these newspapers, and she was curious, and uh, Vivian, her name was Vivian Castlebury. She's passed on now, but um, that's how we got her name, and then they invited her down, and they photographed me and her together, as you can see in that picture. And, uh, and this, you can see, after a couple of days, she was all dolled up, compared to the original. Uh, Kathy got a little bit of notoriety because of that picture. She used it to um, raise money for the Kennedy Library in, in Boston and later wrote a book uh, yeah. about her experience with this photograph. She, she became a celebrity on, on the strength of the picture. And, uh... and there's an interesting story that takes us right up to recent times. Uh, Kathy, the little girl in that picture, has passed away, but by chance you came across a family member. Briefly tell us that story. Um, well, my, my wife and I were on a cruise um, um, in, in, uh, in the Orient, and about offshore of, of uh, Cambodia, I, we found out that the cruise director was Kathy's daughter inadvertently. Um, we, we'd been going to uh, some seminars, photography seminars, and the couple that were running them um, were sitting at the next table and we got talking and, and Louise said, well, Eamon was, was a photojournalist and they said, oh yeah, where did you work? And I said, well, Canada, Dallas, Miami. And they said, well, you, would you happen to know uh, who took that picture? It was famous of Kathy Atkinson. I said, yeah, you're, you're talking to him. <laughs> so they, that was such a coincidence to be uh, 100 miles off the shore of Cambodia in Southeast Asia and run into Kathy Atkinson's daughter. It's a one in a million chance. Wow. And, and that generated some news coverage, it that did. story yeah, about it, that it ran did. in the paper. Yeah, it, it ran on, on the front page of the uh, Dallas Morning News and some other entities have run it overseas. And that was just like a year or two ago that this happened? Last March. Last March. Okay, so not even a year. No. How remarkable that all these years later, this, this one photo comes back and is still a, a big part of your life. And actually, Kathy and her sister came to visit us here in Dallas. Because uh, uh, they're, they're both Texans, of course. And, mm -hmm. and uh, that's when the Dallas Morning News picked up on it. Yeah. Well, let's jump back to uh, what you were doing at Parkland. The wor word comes that the president's passed away. You take some pictures. You capture this extraordinary photograph, which shows Mrs. Kennedy. If you look really closely, Bear, uh, in the dark hair the in the center, middle. There's Mrs. Kennedy getting into the ambulance, and that's going to take the body of her husband back to uh, Love Field, where this all started for you. Yeah. Uh, Eamon, you're a um, 
a journalist, a photographer, you've got a job to do, but does the emotion of the moment, is there ever a time in this when, when the, the, the heaviness of what you're doing kind of weighs down on you? Well, it kind of hit me a few days later. We, we were so busy that uh, covering all these events and subsequent events that we didn't have a lot of time to, to emotionalize about it. It, was just, it just happened and mm -hmm. we, we try and report it. Now, there's an interesting story that doesn't have a photo associated with it because you weren't allowed to take the picture. You get some color film in your camera, uh -huh. and National Geographic, the, the magazine, sends you out to the airport because they want you to take a picture of the new president, sworn in, Lyndon color. Johnson, being sworn in. And, and what happens when you get out there with your color film? Uh, no matter how much I argued with them and pleaded with them, there would be a great historical thing. They wouldn't let me on air. I was at the b bottom of the ramp on Air Force One. They wouldn't let me board. So. How many of you saw that picture of Lyndon Johnson with his hand on the Bible being sworn in as president? It's, but, but, it's produced really big downstairs. It's, it's um, black and white. It's black and white, as Eamon likes to point out. And um, uh, because he wasn't allowed on the plane, we were denied the opportunity to have that, that moment in history recorded in color, which is yep. just a real shame. But you were other places that weekend uh, where you were allowed to take pictures. Um, there were other victims on the day of the assassination. Um, a Dallas police officer named J.D. Tippett was shot and killed in the Oak Cliff section of Dallas. And Eamon, you went to his, his home and took this very somber picture of his widow and the, um, children. the three children he left behind. The widow is named Marie and the kids, uh, the eldest uh, son on the right is Alan, who's passed away, and then little Curtis and Brenda. Now, this must have been a hard thing to do, going into their home, the kids have just it, lost their dad. It, it, is, it, it is tough, you know. Obviously, they're, they were suffering, and, um, and so the, it, it's, it can be emotionally wrenching, uh, covering certain situations, and, uh, but eventually you get over it and go on to the next thing. Were there other photographers that were out there to visit the Tippets and take their picture? Did they pose for several or really no, just I think you? I think I was the only one that got that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, picking back up on the story, Lee Harvey Oswald, of course, as you saw downstairs, was arrested for the murder of President Kennedy. He's at Dallas Police Headquarters. And the shooting of the president was on Friday. Now, come Sunday, it's time for Oswald to be transferred from uh, the Dallas Police Station city custody into the custody of the Dallas County Sheriff's Department, a routine prisoner transfer from city to county. And it was during that transfer that Jack Ruby stepped out and shot Oswald on live television. Now, Eamon, you were originally scheduled to be in that basement? I was scheduled to be at the police station, yes, at the police station where it happened. And uh, I got thinking about it the night before, and I figured all they're going to do is bring him out and put him in a van, and there'll be limited opportunities for any photos. Whereas at the, uh, down, uh, down at the jail, they're going to do mug shots. They're going to parade him around for a while. There'll be more photo. Um, so I, I called Bob Jackson the night before, and I swapped out with him. And he was willing to do it because he, I think he liked to play golf on Saturdays. Um, so when I'm down at the jail, um, Bob Jackson got the Pulitzer Prize for that picture. So you don't believe in the luck of the Irish, because it didn't work that time. <laughs> That picture, uh, you remember Bob Jackson from the photo we, we showed earlier standing next to Eamon at the hospital that day. Bob took this very famous photograph, which did win the Pulitzer Prize in news photography in 1964. Now, while that was happening at uh, Dallas Police Headquarters, you were right here in the Dealey Plaza area because the Dallas County right. Jail is right outside, and you took this photo. In fact, if you look on the far right in this photograph, you can see the corner of our building here, the uh -huh. Texas School Book Depository. Yep. And just, just across the street from here. There were um, these, these uh, people who were celebrating that, that uh, Lee, Har Lee Harvey Oswald had been shot, which I thought was extraordinary, but that's, that's what was happening. Let's, let's think about that for just a moment. That man in the middle of the picture who's waving his cowboy hat around, he is celebrating the shooting of Oswald. Right. That maybe gives you an idea of the emotion of the time. Uh, people 
were so angry uh, and they had been watching television and being fed all this information about Lee Harvey Oswald and so uh, tensions were running really, really high and uh, Jack Ruby would later uh, use this in part of his defense that he got caught up in the emotion of the moment um, when he shot Lee Harvey Oswald. You from here, as soon as you heard that Oswald had been shot, you went back out to Parkland where you were just two days earlier? Exactly. You got inside the hospital this time. Yeah, that's under, under the sheet there is Oswald. Um, it's kind of a creepy photograph that is. you were able to achieve there in the hallway. Lighting was terrible in the hallway. Oh, but it, I think it just adds to the ambiance. It's, it's, uh, if, if I'd used flash, it would have ruined the, uh, the ambiance of, of the darkness of it. It's a, I mean, considering these guys were moving and not posing for you or anything that... Oh, they're moving. Yeah, yeah it, 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 it's, a pretty, um, it's a pretty dramatic and, and excellent portrait. Uh, let's go from the Oswald story and shift over to his murderer, Jack Ruby, because uh, the second part of your story is really remarkable. You covered Jack Ruby's trial right across the street here in 1964. And uh, let's start with one of my favorite pictures you took of Jack Ruby. Um, now, now, this picture was actually taken as Ruby is headed out of the jail for, of all things, a psychiatric evaluation. That's right. And he was uh, up on a ramp and, uh, when I got that picture. And uh, strangely enough, that picture never ran I shot it for the Times Herald, it never ran the Times Herald. Uh, the managing editor had got tired of seeing Jack Ruby's picture every day in the, in the newspaper and he said, I don't want to see his picture in here for another few weeks until the end of the trial or whatever. So I sent it to Life magazine and they used it two pages. And it also ran two pages in every other major magazine around the world, Paris Match, De Stern, um, when it ran in Life magazine, that, that big picture there, it ran with the caption, Is This Man Sane? That's right. Now, did you say anything to Ruby to get that odd expression on his face? No, it, it's just a startled look. It's okay. coincidental. You knew Ruby before this happened? Um, I'd met him. I, I can't say I really knew him, but he used to hang out at the newspaper. He also hang out at the police station. He liked newspaper men and, 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 and cops. So. <laughs> Do you remember what kind of a reputation this guy had? Well, it was, he was a little on the sleazy side. He ran a uh, ran a, 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 a strip club here in Dallas called the Carousel Club. I've never been there, so. <laughs> <laughs> but we used to get free invitations. But, uh, you know, he was he was kind of a shady character. That's all Let's I can say about him. Let's move through some of these great photographs you took at the trial because we have over a thousand pictures that you took just during the Ruby trial. Um, here's the courtroom. Uh, Ruby's not in there at, the t at this moment, but uh, we see uh, Ruby's attorneys and the judge, Joe B. Brown, up there. Um, you weren't allowed in the courtroom during the actual trial. No. You had to just go in there on, during recess and things like that. Yeah. Um, they didn't allow us in the courtroom hardly at all. We spent most of our time in a, in a hallway with about... 200 other journalists. Always like this one. That's it, that's the hallway. Uh, Ruby is surrounded by security there because of course he had jumped out and shot Oswald in a, in a hallway at Dallas Police Headquarters. They weren't gonna let the same thing happen to him. Right. Um, I'm really curious about the, um, there's all those wires and tape in the background and I know what those are, but do you remember those in the hallway, what those were used for? Well, there, it was hard to get a decent shot because you know, the, these guys that are around him are taller. So um, some of the Reuters and Associated Press and other people, life, they were taping with gaffers taped cameras with remote controls and motor drives high up on the walls and pointing down the hallways so they could remotely trigger them um, when, when, uh, when Jack Ruby walked down the hallway. Um, and occasionally, the tape would get loose and expensive cameras would hit that marble floor. It was a horrible, horrible sound, but it'd fall off the wall. And the newspaper photographers like yourself, you'd have to jockey for position alongside those great big uh, video oh, cameras from, yeah, the, from the, the TV they networks. Were, they were enormous, yeah. yeah. And you were all crowded into this hallway, yeah. and all you could do was just take pictures of Ruby coming back and forth during the trial. Exactly. Was it kind of boring after a while? 
Well, occasionally, like at this shot, he, he would have a, a kind of a semi-press conference and, and uh, he would, the people would gather around with microphones and, and you, you get these kind of shots. So. Yeah, it's, it's remarkable today. I mean, if you can imagine someone on trial in a murder trial, accused of murder, uh, basically just freely talking to the news media right. with his lawyer surrounding him. Uh -huh. uh, do you remember any of the comments that Ruby would make during these little impromptu press sessions? Mm, not offhand. I, 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 don't, I don't remember anything specifically. You know. Uh, this next picture is one that I actually just came across for the very first time last week. You guys are the very first group to see this photograph. It's a great profile shot, and, and it's a remarkably happy and confident man, considering that he's on trial for murder. Yeah, I'd, I'd forgotten that, that one. Yeah. Great, great photograph. And I want to talk about Ruby's attorney for a minute. Here he is shaking hands with his lead attorney, a man named Melvin Belli from San Francisco. Exactly. Um, he had multiple attorneys, and we see them all here. They're actually just across the street here on the grassy knoll. Yep. Um, on the far left is a, is a guy from Jasper, Texas, an attorney named Joe Tonahill. In the center is Melvin Belli from San Francisco. And on the uh, right, without the hat, is Phil Burleson, an attorney from here in Dallas. These were Ruby's um, uh, chief attorneys. Yep. What impression did Melvin Belli from San Francisco, what, what did you think of him? Uh, Melvin Belli was a very... Uh, colorful character, to say the least, and uh, and and dramatic, and a very emotional guy. But um, I think you know his background had been uh, tort. Uh, yeah, tort. He was a tort lawyer. Tort lawyer, and I I don't know how they picked him to 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 become uh, the attorney to defend someone who's who committed murder. Yeah, he was a high-profile kind of celebrity attorney of the day. Absolutely. And, and the family brought him in. And the defense he used for Jack Ruby was that uh, it was essentially an early form of an insanity plea. He yep. said that Ruby suffered from something called psychomotor epilepsy and that he was in what was called a fugue state and not aware of his actions when he um, shot Lee Harvey Oswald. And so that was the defense that uh, they used, and um, it ultimately was not successful. It didn't work. I yeah. found him guilty. Now, in the midst of this trial, as things are really boring and you're just watching Ruby come back and forth, a jailbreak happens, a jailbreak uh, entirely unconnected with the Jack Ruby story. Yeah, apparently an inmate had fashioned a gun out of a bar of soap or something. Right. And, um, and, and, and broke out with this fake gun that he put shoe polish on to make it black. And that's, they caught him and that's, they're bringing him back in. There were actually seven inmates that escaped during this big jailbreak. It was uh, on March 6, 1964, and all of them were uh, apprehended by the following day. But this man right here is a guy named Leonard uh, Driggers. And you can see there's the Texas School Book Depository, the building we're in today, right there in the background. And Eamon took this picture of these uh, sheriff's deputies leading him back inside. And the really cool thing for historians when you have photographs from multiple different collections is lining them up perfectly. So we have this picture that Eamon took, and I was able to find this other picture showing Eamon Kennedy there in the background right after taking this picture. It's, it's, I, right. I love matching these things up like that. Mm -hmm. you, didn't, you don't really remember too much about the jailbreak? Not a lot. It, it was kind of a sidelight. Yeah. To the main thing. But it was a dramatic moment when it happened. They actually took oh, yeah. one uh, a secretary hostage and led her down the stairs. But as Eamon said, they didn't have a real gun. Uh, they had taken a bar of soap and carved it into the shape of a gun and used uh, black shoe polish to, to color it black. And in this next photo, we see the Dallas County Sheriff, Bill Decker. And if you look on his desk, you'll actually see that bar of soap. Look at that. It looks real. That's pretty good, isn't it? I think it would have fooled me if, uh, if I was uh, suddenly facing seven escapees coming down a hallway with a, with a hostage. I would have assumed that was a real gun, but uh, nope, that gun right there is made of soap and shoe polish. Um, pretty remarkable thing. Um, so this jury, here is the, the you, took, you took photographs of the jury. Yes. Another weird thing, the idea that a jury would pose for portraits like this. Yeah, you can't, you, you can't do that anymore, but back then you could. So they, they posed for, for a family 
<laughs> yeah, basically, if they were a family for quite a while, sequestered during the trial. And the newspapers back then, uh, they would actually pay, uh, uh, print their names and their addresses in the newspaper. Uh, a remarkable invasion of privacy by 2020 standards, but back then right. it was very commonplace. So this, uh, this Dallas jury was not convinced by the uh, psycho, psychomotor epilepsy defense, and so they found Ruby guilty of murder with malice on March 14, 1964. That's, that's and this is how Ruby's attorney reacted to that. Quite unhappy. Um, he was very unhappy. Do you remember this moment? Oh, yeah. He didn't have nice things to say about Texas. He didn't. Uh, this, this is actually recorded on film and, um, and videotape. And basically, Melvin Belli calls Dallas a city of shame, um, all sorts of things. Uh, there, the video clip is actually on our YouTube channel. You can go to our YouTube channel and watch this whole tirade that runs about two minutes long. Jack mm -hmm. Ruby's attorney just yelling and screaming about the city of Dallas. It's, uh, it's quite a thing to see. A remarkable series of events that you covered, um, just considering that you happened to get off the bus here in Dallas and stay for a while. Well, that's what life is like sometimes. It, 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 strange things happen to you on the way to where you were going. About six years ago, we brought you back to this museum for a reunion with all of the surviving Dallas Times Herald photographers. Um, Bob Jackson, who we've been talking about, who won the Pulitzer Prize, he's there. Another photographer, Willie Allen, is there. And then Daryl Hykus over here, he's passed away. But what was it like, you know, half a century later, to, to come back together with these colleagues that, that you took photographs with during this assassination weekend? Well, it was, it was interesting because I, I kept in touch with Willie Allen, um, who's the second from the left there, over the years. And, uh, but I hadn't seen Bob Jackson uh, since the uh, late 60s, or Daryl Hykus since the early 60s. So it was a, I remember we signed some, uh, we signed some prints. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it was an interesting meeting, and it, it brought back a lot of memories. Uh, oh. Bob Jackson and I used to share, we shared a dark room together. It was, it was two photographers would share a dark room where you processed your film, made your prints, you know. And I was on socially with, with all these guys. We'd, we'd all go out for dinner, and we, we were all friends. Mm -hmm. I want to give you guys a chance to ask Eamon Kennedy a few questions now that you've toured the museum and heard his story. So uh, raise your hand. I'll repeat your question since we're recording this, and we'll get to as many as we can. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, can you talk a little bit about some of the thoughts and emotions that you had just over the course of that weekend while you were doing all of this? Um, well, I don't know if it's an emotion, but one of them was being tired. As we, uh, I think the first night I got three hours sleep and I was back at the newspaper the next day. And it went on like that for several days. So uh, I, I was kind of drained emotionally from, from the whole thing. Yes. Oh, what did you do after all of this died down? What, what kind of normal news things did you cover? Oh, just the, the normal political things and uh, architectural pictures and um, sports. I, it was just the, all the, the run-of-the-mill stuff. You know, we had, we had the Cowboys back then with uh, Tom Landry. And so life went on, but um, it took a while to get back to normal. You know, the... Uh, the Ruby Shaw lasted over a month, mm -hmm. so that, that, that kept us busy. You were uh, what was called a staff photographer, so you would just right. get assignments and you'd be sent out to cover whatever it was going exactly. on. Exactly, yeah. You, you took several pictures uh, of uh, President Johnson and his family as well, right? Um, yes, I did. And in fact, I think I got the first picture I was around at, at Parkland, around the side door when it burst open, and, and uh, Johnson came running out with a couple, some Secret Service people, and I got a shot. And I believe that's the first picture of Johnson right as he was about to become president. Other questions for Mr. Kennedy? Yes, far back there. 
<laughs> I was about four. <laughs> I was 28. 28. That's, that's, that's some good photography for a young 28-year-old photographer that we're looking at here 56 years later. Yes, ma'am. Well, it, it was probably odd the first time, but we've done several of these things, so I'm, I'm kind of getting used to it. <laughs> Eamon is one of our great speakers that we like to bring back because he did play such a crucial role, and we can follow his story visually. It just makes that story come alive. But uh, the first time you were here, as I recall, it was a little different, a little eerie for you maybe to be back in the Texas School Book Depository, right? Yes, yeah. Yes, ma'am. Um, Kennedy or Oswald? Uh, Kennedy. Kennedy. You, you weren't able to go in the hospital, I, right? I tried, to, I tried to get in, and in fact, I borrowed the smock. There was a green one hanging on a hanger there, and, but it had a lot of cameras underneath, so it didn't. They, the Secret Service asked me to leave, likely, of course. Are, are you serious? Yeah. You have never told me that story. Oh. <laughs> You, you, you stole a, a hospital smock and tried to use it to sneak in. Uh -huh. That is remarkable. <laughs> well. See, this is why we record these things, because even, even seven, seven, eight I, programs I, I, later, he tells me new things I've never heard before. forgotten about it. That's great. Uh, yes, sir. Um, did you only work with, like, news companies in Dallas? Or no, before um, I, I worked as a photojournalist in, in Ottawa, Canada for five years and I, I covered Canadian affairs for uh, Time and Life and uh, a bunch of Canadian magazines and newspapers. And how long were you with the Times-Herald? Well, I was with them twice. It was, um, I think, th three years the first time and maybe a year and a half the second. Yeah. What was Ruby's sentence? Oh, Jack Ruby's sentence. Do you wanna, do you wanna talk about that or you want me to? Um, no, go ahead. I, I know he's found guilty, but I, I think he was, wasn't he sentenced to life? No, he was actually given the death penalty. He was found guilty of murder with malice. The Dallas jury decided that he deserved the death penalty. His uh, attorneys appealed that sentence, and uh, a couple of years later, that guilty verdict was actually overturned by the Court of Criminal Appeals, and they said that Jack Ruby could not have received a fair trial in Dallas where emotions were so high. That's right. So they were going to have a new trial for Ruby in a, in a town called Wichita Falls, Texas in 1967. Jack Ruby got really sick sick at the end of 1966, and he died at Parkland Hospital, the same hospital where Kennedy and Oswald died. He died there on January 3rd, 1967, uh, just a few weeks before that new trial was going to start. We, we used to call Parkland the pain and body shop. The, the what now? Pain and body shop. Pain and body shop. It was a major trauma center. Oh, yes, uh, it was. It was and, and still is to this day. Uh, in the very far back, yeah, in the blue. What That's car? An excellent question. What car did you have? You back probably there? never heard of this car. It was called a Studebaker, <laughs> and it was a, a Studebaker Hawk. It was very fast. Had a V8, and it was stick shift, and I was very proud of it at the time. It's a collector's item now. Good question. We've never been asked about what car you drove. Let's get one from this side of the room over here. Oh, that's a, that's a good question. The question was, why was Ruby given the death penalty and Oswald was just sent to prison? The thing is, Lee Harvey Oswald never actually had a chance to go to trial. Uh, Jack Ruby shot him in police custody just um, 48 hours after the assassination. Yes. Um, Ru Oswald would have gone to trial the next year. In fact, early on, one of the reasons Ruby gave for shooting Oswald was he said he wanted to spare Mrs. Kennedy from possibly having to come back to Dallas to testify in a trial. And so caught up in the emotion of the moment, he just decided to take matters into his own hands and kill Oswald. Uh, but, but it was um, a murder, obviously, that millions and millions of people witnessed. It was live on television and played instant, an early form of instant replay, yep. played over and over again. So the idea was no one questioned whether or not Jack Ruby shot Oswald. The question was, was it premeditated? You guys know what that word means? Planned in advance. That really determined, like, the severity of his sentence. Yes, sir. The gentleman who's yawning right there. <laughs> Taking 
pictures. Was, was that your first job, taking pictures? No, I, well, first job, I was in the, uh, I was in the air, uh, doing my national service in the Royal Air Force in England, and I worked on jets. So, but I was very interested in photography, and got, as soon as I got out, I, I started a photography career. These folks want to know some personal stuff about you, Eamon. That's yeah. great. Yeah, what's your question? Excellent question. What's the proud, what, 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 what photograph are you the most proud of today? Doesn't have to be Kennedy assassination. That's such a difficult question to answer, you know. Um, I think one of the most striking pictures was, was fr from the Jack Ruby, it was the Jack Ruby picture. Where he's got that weird expression on his face. Yeah, because, it, and the fact that the paper I worked for wouldn't use it, but it was used everywhere else in the world. Um, so I th that was a su successful picture. And it was, the thing about that one, it was, it was happening around lunch hour and, and, and nobody wanted to cover it because it was interfering with their lunch. And I went down, I said, I'll, I'll take it. And <laughs> that's when that happened. Right place, right time. Yeah. We, have, we have time only for a couple more questions. We'll, we'll take this one right over here. Good question. What made you become a photographer? Um, I was always intrigued by it from, from the time I was about 10 years old. And I, I used to, uh, I was living in London, and I, I read every book in public libraries all around me on, on photography and how to, how to do it. And, and I finally got a decent camera and a dark room. Because, you know, back then, you, it, was, it was actually on glass plates. And... Uh, and it, it just obsessed me from then on. I, I, I always, it's, it's, it's always, it was my hobby. It's what I always wanted to do, and that's what I did. And last question, someone that hasn't asked one yet. Yes, ma'am, right there. Am I still doing it? Yeah. Yeah, I'm doing, doing it as a, a fine art form. My, my wife and I travel quite a bit, and uh, we find interesting places around the world to photograph. And I have a website. If, if you're interested, it's just my name and dot com, Eamon Kennedy dot com. There's his, there's his name back there up on the screen. Um, now, Eamon, are you shooting digital today or are you still using film? No, I haven't used film in quite a few years now. It's all digital. Do you like using digital? It's easier. <laughs> <laughs> but can you capture the same Yeah, I, I think you can, I think, yeah, I think the only difference between film and digital is that it's how you record something. It has nothing to do the way you see it. You see it the same way, but it's just more convenient to catch it on, on digital. And, uh, and, and, uh, and you can do more with it afterwards. So that's... Very good. Well, I wanna thank you guys. You have asked some really terrific questions today and I hope you enjoyed your visit to the Sixth Form Museum. Please join me in thanking Eamon Kennedy for being our guest today.